Oi, Budge. In this episode of Budge, we talk to Hetty Johnston, child safety advocate and founder of Australia's most well-known child protection charity, Bravehearts. Hetty was kind enough to share her story and advice on improving child protection. We hope you find this episode to be really valuable and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you're listening. So you were at risk of going to jail for identifying yes. your own child. Yeah, I'll who, never who, forget it. And even, even though the the perpetrator was in jail. Correct. And, and is that still the law? No. Okay. Change. It's the first law I changed. It's kind of the worst thing you can feel that a child can go through. You know, you just can't imagine it and it sort of brings you to tears just trying to imagine it so you don't want to imagine mm. it. We know that most sexual offences are committed by people known and trusted to the family. Increasingly peers like brothers and sisters and siblings and, and other young people but also fathers and stepfathers and grandfathers. We know that in any one of those circumstances that's going to be absolutely catastrophic for the family. Welcome to Budge, How to Fudge Being Human, uh, the podcast that helps us be better at being human. Make sure you like, subscribe and follow us on YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple or wherever you can find our podcast. I'm here with Dr. Darren Coppin, behavioural scientist, writer, speaker and lots of other things. How are you, mate? I'm, I'm, I'm good and just psychoanalyzing why you always say doctor with an element of surprise. <laughs> shock. Shock I like to use the and shock. horror. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Usually we um, we have sort of uh, some sort of pretty jovial conversations about human behaviour, but today's subject matter is is probably the most serious we've ever talked about. Uh, and I'm really delighted today to be joined by Hetty Johnson. Um, I should have checked. A M O A M. A M. A M. A M. Um, Hetty uh, is. We're going to be covering today. Um, Hang on. Uh, more than half our audience is from overseas. That doesn't mean we, she only operates in the morning. <laughs> it means Australian. Trust me, it's 24-7. Yeah. We're just trying to get this done by midday. Yeah. Yeah. What does AM stand for? Oh, it's just an, it's one of the categories of the Order of Australia. There you That's go. A, so it's an, yeah. a federal award. It's for the yeah. palms, it'd be like an OBE, it's, MBE. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's been all organised through the Governor-General's. Yes. So very English. Yes, yeah. And, and the reason you, you have that is because of your amazing work in child safety. Um, yes. You, you are, you are the, 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 national, the co-chair of the National Advisory uh, Board for um, the, the National Child the Safety national, Office. Yeah, the Office. National Office of Child Safety. safety. Which, of course, was the outcome of a Royal Commission here in Australia, yeah. yes. uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And, and, and also you are the founder um, and until recently one of the, the, the chair of uh, Bravehearts, which is probably, I would say, Australia's most famous, well-known organisation that supports... Um, child safety. Yes, that's right. Brave House Foundation. Um, I think it probably is because it was the first. Yeah. So thank so. you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, uh, we we really me. appreciate it. Um, I guess first up, Hetty, is, is um, maybe just tell us a bit about Brave Hearts and a bit about the sort of the work that you do. Um, okay, a bit about Brave Hearts. It's uh, dedicated to the issue of child sexual assault. It comes about after. Look, I'm an, I'm a um, I'm just like everybody else. There's nothing special about me. Trust me. Um, I, I'm I'm actually an accountant or a, a oh senior, no another a financial. one yes I know. that's what that's where I started and we all try to get out of it we do we don't like it very much yeah. at all um, I still don't like it but anyway <laughs> um, so I did that and then I was doing you know running companies and things and um, in administratively and then I got involved in a campaign about koalas and toll roads and oh was that back in the 1990s it the, was um, the Beto Eastern Tollway yeah they were trying to build a motorway here in Queensland weren't yes, they yes they went straight through. Um, Australia's largest, yeah. what was then, Australia's largest remaining koala habitat, yeah. which was close by me and I was just had our daughter, Kayleen, so yep. I was at home. I'm dangerous when I'm bored. <laughs> I really am. And so I just, Sorry, just, just for people that don't know this, this is very famous in the 90s in Australia. Literally the Queensland government tried to put a motorway through a, a very well-known koala habitat. Yes, yep. and, and upset a lot of people because yep. before the election they said they wouldn't do that. So we all went ahead and voted. Mm. And then after the election they changed their mind. So we spent... Me and a whole bunch of others spent the next three years oh, just, it was, talk about human behaviour, my goodness, the things we did. We, we scraped like dead animals off the road. Oh. We did. And, wow. and we put them on black plastic with white lines down the middle to demonstrate what was going to happen to these animals. These animals were already, you know, not with us any longer. Yeah, yep. So um, So it was pretty... It was pretty full on, pretty gruesome, but it made its point and we just had to keep getting in the news because we didn't have a budget. Yep. You know, we just had to make the news, six o'clock news. And anyway, government lost and um, that government, which was a really strong government here in Queensland, lost government Yeah. Um, through that. So that's where I learnt my 
So I've got the administration bit. Now I've learned about politics, public speaking, how yeah. to motivate people. And then I worked for Senator Kernow, who was a leader of the Australian Democrats in Queensland at mm-hmm. the time and became the leader of the party in Queensland, state leader, and learned about federal politics in the Senate. Da, 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 da. And then our daughter was sexually assaulted. Um, whilst there was an election going on, I asked my husband if he would take her to New Zealand to visit his family. So I didn't have to cook and clean and do all those things that you need to do otherwise and I could just concentrate. One thing, you know, I put blinkers on when I'm focused, I'm focused yep. and that's it. And I thought I just really want to do the best I can mm. here. So um, I asked him to go to Queensland, uh, to New Zealand and visit his family, um, which he did. And uh, whilst they were over there, um, our daughter disclosed sexual assault by my husband's oh, I'm father. Sorry. Um, that's ho- that's okay. I mean, things happen. Things happen. You know, mm. it's how you respond to them that that makes the difference. What you don't know, you don't know. He responded. She, he responded beautifully because he's just the most gorgeous man on the planet. Believed her immediately. Mm. And um, long story short, he finished up going to jail. We went to counselling. Um, he's passed away now. Our daughter is now thirty seven. She's strong, beautiful, all those things. But at the time. So that's the, I say that now because always I forget to say that and the question comes back, but how's your daughter now or you know, mm. what happened to him? And I always miss those bits so I thought I'd throw that in now. The thing about it was when, when she disclosed and my husband rang me from New Zealand, we, I didn't know what to do about it because it's not something that's ever been in my life. I never thought about it. I was totally ignorant, never contemplated it for a second. Um, and so I, was try- so I it was late at night uh, when the, when my husband rung, I was a mess. I was a total mess because I just couldn't, I couldn't comprehend it, and I couldn't process it, and I couldn't fix it. I had to fix it. I have to fix everything. I feel like I have to fix things, and I, I didn't know where to start. And I was just totally um, under. Uh, if, you, if you ever look through a kaleidoscope, it it's, it moves, and there's it, it, there's nothing static in it, and there's no top and bottom and left and right, it's just all a big mess and that's how my life felt at the time. I totally out of control and I do like a bit of control. So being out of control was really um, foreign to me. So we had a few neighbours who were doctors that came and gave me some medication because I just said, I've just got to go to sleep, I just can't cope, I'm not processing, this is killing me here. So they gave me some drugs but I woke up really early a couple of hours later and turned on the computer and started looking for, and keeping in mind this is back in 1996, so it was a dial-up, <laughs> if you remember those ones. Anyway, so it comes up and I'm typing in child sexual abuse and I'm seeing all these statistics, which even back then were like one in five kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I had the back of a how to vote Senate paper, which is anyone who's voted knows it's about as long as a toilet roll. These things are massive. And I had it and I was writing all these organisations' names and phone numbers down on it um, of, every, of the people I was going to ring, you know, when the sun came up. And when I did ring them, there was nobody at home. Like, they didn't do it. It wasn't an organ. I was shocked and horrified to know that even, even back then one in five was the statistic that was being said, one in five children before 18, will be sexually assaulted. And I think you said to us earlier on that that number is even worse. It is now, yeah. Well, we've had just recently, the last last week or even Tuesday, I think it was, the child Australian Child Maltreatment Study released, which is a huge study commissioned by the, the Royal Commission, again, um, which looks over which looked over the, the lifespan of... It took five years and it's just incredibly intense. And um, one in four now. Wow. One in four, so we know. It's, just, it's it, But there was no organisation. Now, now you, there is. You did, uh, we'll, we'll come on to this as, as part of the story, but you, you organised something called a White Balloon Day that yeah. resulted in more than a 500% increase in disclosures and reports to the yeah. police, uh, which is just... It, it, to call that gratifying is really an odd word to use, but um, it... it it's clearly opened it up and made a difference to people's lives and they can approach it. And do you think that's where the increase in numbers has come from? People actually disclosing and feeling that there's someone there to listen to them and there's something they can do? Yes, the disclosure rates have risen, um, most definitely. Yeah, that was phenomenal. That was because there wasn't anyone talking about it in this country before that. And then White Balloon Day gave all those survivors permission to speak up 
and they did. And those statistics were, well, they were heartening, even though they were horrible because they meant that it was working, you know, that finally we could talk about it Um, because we needed to talk about it. And, yeah, when I first started talking about it, I was threatened with jail and court and all sorts of things. So so you were threatened with jail for talking about child abuse? Yes, because in, well, across the country um, it is an offence to uh, speak or to... to, um, publicly disclose the identity of a child who's been sexually assaulted right. for privacy reasons. So by virtue of me as a parent speaking out, saying, you know, I'm the parent of a child who's been harmed in this way, I was identifying or never by name or by... So, so you were at risk of going to jail for identifying yes. your own child? Yeah, I'll who, never who, forget it. And even, even though the, the perpetrator was in jail? Correct. And, and is that still the law? No. Okay. Change, just the first law I changed. Right. So There's how did how, many out, so, so how, how was that fight? How did you go about changing oh, that law? It was um it was it was interesting because it was it was one of the it was the first one, um just by being bloody mindedly determined <laughs> and I knew I was right. Yep. And I just thought, look, I said to them in this room, oh, we went to it, the government. It was the government of the day, and they had this meeting, and they got all the media to come, and they weren't allowed to bring their cameras or their mics or you know anything recording. It was just a, it was a, what are we going to do about this bloody woman who won't shut up over mm. here and how are we going to look at the laws around this? And so they all came in and I, I remember... So, so Hattie, what, what year was this, Hattie? Oh, uh, that would have been 97 okay. or 98 maybe. Mm. Um, and I remember feeling incredibly intimidated because I... No one was really talking to me. They were, everyone was looking the other way, you know, which is really unusual for the media because by then I knew a lot of them. In the media, they'd become so many friends. They're still today, my friend. Mm. So I knew I was in trouble. Um, but anyway, and I remember sitting where I was sitting. The door was just, just, just over here to my left, and I remember looking at the door a few times, thinking <laughs> maybe I should just go. Um, but no, I stayed, and I said to them this: I said to them, "You, nobody in this room, and it's actually to the director general at the time, um, is going to tell me to be quiet about this. Don't, no one's going to go shh." Mm. And don't you and don't you tell me to tell my daughter shh, because the moment I do that, the moment she's shushed, she's shamed. She knows that there's something happened to her that she should feel ashamed. Yeah. About. And I'm not putting that ball and chain around her ankle. I'm not. You can do what you want with me. You know. I'm not telling her that what happened to her. And I tell the story about the. I, I, I know I'm limited for time, but I really need to say this. No, you you, you go for it. You. Um, when I'm speaking, I. Tell people, I ask people to close their eyes and imagine a child walking through a park, beautiful day, mm. person jumps out from behind a bush and hits the child across the head. Has the child done anything wrong? No. Should the child tell somebody? Yes. Yep. Should we believe the child? Yes. Should yep. we support the child? Should we silence the child? No. Mm. Is the child a victim of crime? Yes. Mm. Okay. Same child, same path, same bush. This time child is sexually assaulted. Has the child done anything wrong? No. Should we silence the child? No. You know, should we support the child? Is the child a victim of crime? Yes. Yep. So why do we look at survivors of sexual assault as somehow tainted? It's some cultural throwback from the from a long whenever. time. Whenever, yeah. But never should have happened in the first place. We children are victims of crime. End of story. Absolutely. What happens if that child doesn't want their name to be public? Um, well, their name's not public. Mine. I've never named her, but yeah. by virtue of saying she's my daughter, she has a name. But I can honestly, I'm, I mean, she speaks her own herself now on this. Mm. I mean, all we communicated with her because she was seven, six or seven at the time, and said, "This is what we're doing." You know, how do you feel about it? Does it how are you going at school? There was no negative feedback for her at all, ever to mm. this day, ever. And you know, when they say the biggest fear around that legislation was built around the fact that they say if children have been sexually assaulted, they they are likely to be sexually assaulted again or more prone to be sexually assaulted yep. again over over the years. Now, that reasoning comes from the fact that those kids are silenced and disempowered. Wow. The, the moment the child is, is sexually assaulted, they're disempowered. Mm. That person takes something away from them, their power. But when they've given their power back, as we did with our daughter, she knew that she he went to jail, he was... He was on the black horse and she was on the white horse, you know. He he went to jail. She didn't get in trouble. He did the wrong thing. It was really clear for her. And and she she never suffered as a result of it. She just never did. And she would say 100% the same thing now. 
But there's there's something you do intuitively, and I don't know whether it was trained or you've trained yourself, but earlier, um, Paul's daughter, Kitty, was in the room and you said, uh, yeah, uh, we said, oh, we're going to be talking about this. If there's anything you're uncomfortable with, you're, you're welcome to just walk out of the room and, uh, and not have to listen to it. Mm. What you did was you gave her the responsibility and empowered her to do something. Now, was that something you did naturally, like it sounds like you did with your daughter, the way you approached it and spoke about it, or have you yeah. learned to, to act like Probably a like combination that? of those things, you know. But I think the last thing I ever want to do is make anyone feel uncomfortable, but I know this topic does make people feel uncomfortable. Yep. In fact, I think our kids are far better at listening to this than we are because they're, they've been, yeah. they're, they're now hearing it. They understand it as a risk of life. You know, just like crossing the road, not looking left and right. They get this stuff better than we do. Or they might not get it, but they certainly, hopefully, they understand that it's there. And it's a it's a it's a danger which <laughs> many parents just refuse to accept. Yeah, why is why are people uncomfortable? Is it because of their own history or they don't want to confront it? Or why do you yeah, think it's a it combination is? of exactly that, And That's exactly what happens. I think. Um I think for some people they don't – if they feel like if they talk about it, they'll bring it to them. They'll draw it to them. I, and I always say – and I think it's – for some it's because they're survivors and, and they don't want to talk about it because then they have to think about it and then all those feelings and, and memories come flooding back again. Then mm. the nightmares start and everything else. So it's better for some people to just push it away and keep it pushed away. Some people are able to do that, lock it up and don't think about it until maybe they're, aid, they're old or something happens and it comes back. But I think a lot of people just, um, it is such a frightening scenario if it were to happen. And, it, it, you know, we know that most sexual offences are committed by people known and trusted to the family. Um, increasingly peers, like uh, brothers and sisters and siblings and, and other young people, but also fathers and stepfathers and grandfathers, like in our case. We know that in any one of those circumstances, that's going to be absolutely catastrophic for the family. Um, not just that the child has been sexually assaulted, as if that's not bad enough, but the tremor of that through the whole family. Um, so for, you'll find many, well, uh, marriages dissolve, kids are, mm. mar- mums are, tr- are, got, are they homeless because they're running away with their kids. The federal court and the family court's not believing them. No one's believing them because no one believes children and they're all nominating this mother as some crazy woman who's made it up to get some sort of nasty on the husband. And We, we have to cover that point, don't we, that something you and I have talked about, we talked about before this, believing children. We have exactly the same issue with, with adults, with, with sexual crimes, um, yep. domestic violence. But you told us before the statistic, there is a statistic which around how often children tell the truth mm-hmm. around this. Yeah, between 95 and 98, when they're two and under, or two and around two, 98%. Yeah, so we should, the, yep. the stats tell us that children are telling the truth and we should 100%. believe them. Just yep. believe them. Yep. And, how and was then, that ascertained, by the way? How did they Outcomes work, of uh, investigations and things like that. So they yeah. made an accusation, yeah. it was investigated 98% of the time when they're two. They may not have been able to prove 95. it enough to take it to court. That's yeah. a different, that's a different uh, level of proof. But... um. Or it, they're longitudinal studies too, so pe- people who've disclosed as children and then later on in adulthood, you know, they're asked the question. Um, and it's more than one study, there's been many studies. But we know that we need to listen to children. Mm-hmm. We have to listen to children. You know, and those that don't, that are not telling the truth, usually apparently that was because they were confused about something. Yeah, so it wasn't you know? necessarily intentional or malicious. It no. was just... Yes. Yeah. This is serious complaints. We're not talking mm. about, you know... But basically, if a child's not going to come up to you, I can tell parents this, and just blurt out what's happened. Well, yeah. sometimes it can happen, but generally it doesn't. Mm. It'll happen in little tiny bits of information because they're testing how how you're going to respond because mm. their whole life is in the balance here. You know, if you don't believe them, then you know all these bad things might happen to them. The family, mm. might, they might get not loved anymore, or you know all these things. So they're very careful. Mm. So they drip feed information. This mm. is fascinating because what you started to touch on is how can you recognise signs in your child that something might be going on? Yes, and it's like them testing or drip feeding little yep. bits of information. Mm. Yeah, they'll throw little 
throw little things around to see if you pick it up or not. I don't like Uncle Harry. I shouldn't say Uncle Harry. Sorry if the Harry's out there. Uncle Lightbulb. <laughs> yeah. You know, I Harry don't like. Harry and Megan. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Harry. Um, yeah, yeah, Uncle Lightbulb. And, and most, a lot of parents will just go, oh, just don't worry about it. Just stay away from it. You're busy, you know, you're cooking, you're trying to get dinner on, on the table. But the, the thing to do there is go, stop, mm. sit down on the little chair. Why don't you like Uncle Lightbulb? Tell me about that. And then they then they might give you a bit of information and you just let them don't, you know, just let them talk. And, you know, what happened then? And all those questions, you know, without sort of saying, did he touch you on you or whatever? Um, because that's not what you want to do. You don't want to put the ideas in the kid's head. You want to know from them. But even, even, and you do question because I did. I mean, I know you're not supposed to, but I did because I wanted to know. Yeah. And I did it with a tape record. I did a bit of research first to find out how to do this effectively. And um, I recorded it all on – I sat lie down with her and on the, on our bed and just asked her to tell me what happened and she just went through it all. And I, it's really hard to, to listen to that and not want to scream or swear or yeah. interrupt or something. Mm. You really have to have it together to do this one. But um, you just keep breathing. Yeah. Just keep breathing and stay calm and just let her talk and that's what I did. And it was based on that recording that we got the conviction. Um, that and, and in the end all the other survivors came out because when oh, I was so, doing so he, this, he he'd actually assaulted other children? Two generations of females in that family wow. across forty years. Mothers and their daughters. No one ever said anything. Mm. That's the other but really, why, 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 um, in, in, in your experience then, why why don't people say anything? Because I don't think they're going to be believed, mm. especially back then. You know, we weren't even talking about it. So who's going to believe them? And then, what happens to them? What? How do people look at them? Do they lose some sort of agency around themselves? Then do they become um, a damaged goods? Or you know, they're they're just the whole fear of what happens next. Yeah. It's funny. One of the human behaviours um, that I always notice is we and, and we mentioned Donald Trump in a previous conversation that. We always he has this ability to reminisce about the past as though the past was always fantastic, and we, we look to the past as the way forward. And whenever people reminisce about the past, how good it was in the old days, for some reason this always pops into my head: how domestic violence and child abuse was always hidden in the family. Yes. Uh, do you feel though over time we have got better about exposing this and bringing it out from the secrecy that he used to have? Oh, Donald Trump is wrong about so many things, isn't oh, he? Oh, absolutely. Uh, liking everything. Um, yep. I think that's right. Domestic violence is the same. People mm. used to just look the other way because yeah. it wasn't our business. Behind closed doors, family's business. And um, it's not. It's not at all. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's awesome that today all of these behaviours that demean women and children especially, I know men are also victims of domestic violence, mm. um, but in such small numbers compa yeah. and comparatively, um, that we stand up for, for. We have to stand up for ourselves too. Yeah. We can't expect some white knight on a shining, you know, come rolling in the door. Um, and we are. I think women are taking some power, taking their power back. This this disempowerment and this fear and this feeling unable to protect yourself and all and, and understanding that the system's not there to protect you. That's a big deal. Because if you're if you're um, if there's a criminal act that's just happened against you, you want to go to police, you want the police to take it seriously and, you know, a lot of time that just wasn't happening. Yeah, is that is it's improving or not? Yes, I think it is. Yeah, I think the pressure's on. Yeah, and, and we need to keep it on. Yep. Um, because you know we want to be safe too. Mm. We don't want to be beaten and and raped and mm. and our, we certainly don't want our children. I mean, we know what happens with children. Um, the, the statistics out of this child maltreatment study are just frightening in terms of you know what happens. Yeah. Maltreatment. Sixty-two percent of children have been maltreated seriously that's serious neglect emotional physical mm. or sexual assault 62 percent that's insane what's going on yeah what's yeah. going on? and a lot of it is connected to domestic violence so it's inside the home mm. so we're it's dysfunctionality and it's increasing and, I think. and the perpetrators often come from a background where they've been abused and where they and it's like a cycle that continues and continues and continues yeah, it, it does mm. and, and is that true people assume that and i've heard arguments which might well be true that a lot of people sexually abuse children because they were sexually abused as a child and they're normalizing it is there any evidence right. that that's uh, no not really um the, the facts that i you know and i'm in i'm in my nose in this all the time 
Um, most sex offenders, well, sex offenders are equally drawn from people statistically um, equally across offending and non-offending, so really? those that have been and haven't been. But the biggest indicator really um, is some sort of child maltreatment, absolutely. Sexual assault, not not specifically. Okay. So, so, so disem- disempowerment? When, so when disempowerment. You talk about, right, okay. Again, so but like bullies at school, they're yeah. probably being, something's happening for them at home, yeah. getting beaten up or they're, uh, you know, they're being maltreated at home. So they're, they're, pow- they're losing their power. So mm. they're going to come to school and they're going to, they're going to, take their power back and they're going to wield that over somebody else yeah. because that makes them feel better again, you know. Yeah. We've always, I guess we've always known that, that people treat other people badly in order to make themselves feel better. Um, you've, so you, you spent the best part of, what, 25, 30 years fighting this fight. Yes. You know, you, you created Brave Hearts. Uh, you, you're the co-chair of the National Advisory Organisation. Um, what, what haven't we achieved yet? Um, we haven't yet. I mean, we talk about the best interest of children. We we talk about it ad nauseum and we write it on everything I've read. We talk about prevention in the same way mm. and we don't do it. We just don't do it. What, we don't what, do it well. What don't we do? We don't prevent. Okay. We don't prevent. We don't We don't prioritise the best interests of children. One of the things we, ha- we, we haven't really talked about um, in terms of your journey is... is 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 your response to this this is it this awful thing that happened to your daughter was um, to go and lead the fight uh, to 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 change the laws in Australia to empower children to bring this out from from behind you know locked doors in houses um, on a personal basis though what, 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 have you have you had to go through any other sort of journey to come to terms with everything that happened? Um, no, I think this did it for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I, I don't know why I reacted the way I did. I just once I knew the stats how many kids were being harmed and once I understood what the how that manifests mm. in, in the community um, and with the background of politics and so forth um, in there and I just knew that I had all the – everything I needed to actually do this, inclu- yeah. including some dollars because yeah. you needed money to run something like that. And, um, and I just – I don't know. I don't know how else I could have dealt with it, to be frank. You know mm. how they say people, you know, we, don't, we want our person's – death for instance to mean something mm. to, to I think that's the same for me I, I couldn't just go well he went to jail we've got our counseling what's for dinner I it, it just was too big for me yeah I, I'm, I'm actually a really big believer in the universe unfolding as it should and I I think I'm this is my destiny and this is why I'm here and this is what I'm doing yeah because yeah, I, I wrote a note here that you you know you you woke up the next day, tried to contact people. No one was picking up the phone, which was a bit of a, a catalyst for you yeah. c- creating someone on the other end of the phone. But it, but a lot of people want to move on, um, and yeah. it must be ex- it must have been exhausting on a lot of levels. Um, keeping working in this, yes. and the only thing that I know that can keep you going with that sort of thing is a sense of purpose. That's right, um, and 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 making a difference, and and that's and that's exactly what it was. Do you feel you have, or is there any oh, data definitely. to suggest? No, no, I'm really proud of the. Oh, definitely, like oh, definitely, um, just particularly individuals. You know, I, there's not a day when I go out um, in public, wherever it might be. So if I go to the shopping centre, or I go out for lunch, or I can be in overseas even, um, where someone doesn't come up to me and say. It wasn't for you, so and so, or thank you for what you do because so and so. It just every day. I swear, every day when I'm out, if I'm out, that happens. Yeah. So I think at a at a um, at an actual level on the ground, it's there. It was a hundred percent. And also in legislation, I mean, we we introduced it was me that when little Kira Steinhardt died in Rockhampton by a um, known predator, a terrible pedophile. Whose name escapes me? Well, let's right, let's you, not name yeah. him. Yeah, we I know, know it now. It's in my brain. I've got mm. it back. But um, okay, he's dead now. Good. Oh, all together now. Oh, sorry, mm. had to throw mm. that in. Um, he raped and killed her. Little twelve-year-old schoolgirl just coming home from just coming home from school, mm. and um, he went to jail. But when he he went to jail for that, but then he came. Out. No, before he was released, that's right, he committed a lot of terrible crimes, not murder, but terrible crimes, sexual crimes, and they were going to release him. And the community was an outrage. We, we can't release him. And I said, you can't release him. You can't release him. Um, but you, 
you could because there was no law to keep them in. Um, and then little Kira died, so we lobbied for a law that would keep them in. Yep. Not if not their, their release. So it's the Dangerous Prisoners Sexual Offenders Act, yep. 2003, and it is across the country now. And that means that an offender um, who's deemed to be dangerous reaches the end of his sentence, they can still be detained post their sentence um, Good. for community safety yeah. reasons. And do we have that in all states of Australia? Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. Is there data on reoffending? Can you treat... Somebody oh, else done such this. a contentious, it's so contentious. Can you? I don't know. Can you treat an alcoholic and then be guarantee they're never going to have another drink? Mm. You know, it's like an addictive behaviour. I think for some, for some um, offenders, that you that for some offenders, I think there is some. There's obviously good chances, particularly young people who are offending. I mean, there is so much hope for them. Most kids who commit these offences in childhood don't go on and become adult sex offenders. That's for everyone to know. Um, but they need intervention and they need support and they need help. Um, offenders who commit against their own family members only, there is also indications that I've read that that would, can be successful. But those that offend outside of the family and moreover just generally, I don't believe there is. And I know... I can't say that that's supported in research. It's just supported in my experiences of uh, seeing offenders go to jail and get out and go to jail and get out. Mm. And I think at some point we do have to prioritise the best interests of children. And when it comes to sex offenders, we've, we've said to government, what you need to do is before you release sex offenders, I don't care if they spend an hour, uh, two years in jail or 20 years. For me, that's not the issue. The issue is, are they dangerous still? If we release this person, will they offend again? And so we have to get better at assessing that bit mm. um, because there's no... I mean, punishment is one thing, but it's it's really more about dangerousness for me. And I think... Um, so I said, you know, well, why don't you get three independent assessments and unless they all come back as a, as a low risk, that they shouldn't be released. If they are released, then there is supervision for so many years... And so we get – at least we give our kids a fighting chance and our families, but just releasing them because their time's up doesn't make any sense to me at all. So what can we do to protect our children better? Are there any key tips? Pay attention, you know, pay attention in everything they do. Like give them – you've got to be their best friend as well as their parent because if you're not – if you're not paying attention and you're not giving them what they need emotionally, physically and all those, they'll get it from somewhere else. That's what offenders are looking for. They're looking for children who are, who are um, you know, not 100%. It's not to say, I'm particularly thinking about online here. Yeah. Um, who get online and they're looking for confirmation about you're beautiful, you know, I don't know why, your parents don't understand you, I do, all of this stuff, right? So. Wow. So I, I thought that was tip was going elsewhere with pay attention. In other words, listen to them like the previous 100%. tip when they say stuff, yeah. but... Pay attention, listen to them, but support them. Be a parent. Be present. But, so they're not present. looking elsewhere and reaching out the, yeah. in, into the hands of a predator. And listen to the research around this. And, um, and absolutely listen to your children. The biggest key is, is that's about being present. You know, help them read books. When they're, on their inter when they're on their phones, be with them. Watch what they're doing. Participate. Disable chat functions. Hello, everybody. Disable. Chat functions. So I just explained for, for, for the technically, technologically, uh, you know, non-minded like Darren. What, 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 do you, what do you mean by that, sorry? Well, you know, any games that, that yeah. your kids are playing where they're able to have a conversation with somebody else. Yeah. Um, somebody else can chip in and they can introduce themselves to your child, usually pretending to be a child themselves. Yeah, I remember back in the day, because my twins are 22 now, they, that, was the, that was when they started that, that Penguins game, do you remember it? And, 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 um, and, and that, that became synonymous with... Uh, predators creating their own avatars and, oh, play, avatars, uh, yeah. and, play, and playing in this game and it was it was because the internet was so new that's it yeah but it can be anything it can be just any game at all they'll mm. get in there they'll just be a kid they know how to do this the thing you've got to know about predators is that they have no empathy they don't care yeah they're, they're like the nigerian people that steal people's money yeah they don't care end game your child is their end game and they they are patient and they are persistent and they are just um, 
bloody minded about it. They're, they're not empathetic in any way. It's most of, that is a common trait for sex offenders is the lack of empathy. Mm. Um, so well, so it's, it's a sociopathic thing. Is it, Darren, or something different? Well, no, you wouldn't do it in the first place if you thought about how that child's feeling now. Yeah. And, and this is one of the issues we have with people that haven't been uh, exposed to it. Um, it's unimaginable. Yeah. Um, this, this is, it's kind of the worst thing you can feel that, that a child can go through. You know, the, you just can't imagine it. And it sort of brings you to tears just trying to imagine it. So you don't want to imagine mm. it. But that can have other problems in blinkering yourself to hints and things that are being said. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you know, from small church groups or, or church groups and families that go, oh, we don't have to worry about that. Everyone's a f- we're all family here. We all mm. know each other. It's all good. And this is where it mo- it happens mostly there. Yeah. So you're dead, right? You can't you can't go around looking at everybody as though they're a perpetrator either. And whilst most perpetrators are men, most men are not perpetrators. Yeah. So what you need to do is look for behaviour. You ne- you're looking for behaviour both in your children and in those people that interact with your children. And if you're smart, you're doing bit of checking around organisations or schools and daycare centres and so forth, mm. sporting groups that your children are involved in. You're making sure they've got safeguarding policies in place. You're making sure people have got blue cards, working with children checks, you know, whatever that organisation is doing everything it can do to stop offenders from getting through their front door. And we had a um, Commonwealth Games here not not so long ago and you were mm. involved in safeguarding yes. policies for that. What did... what? What did you do or what, what um, did that involve? Well, we just talked about what were the risks for children in a, in a mass environment like that. Right. Um, so we sort of helped to come up with some strategies around how to manage volunteers, for instance, and also clues about what sort of behaviours should volunteers, should the volunteers and, and officials and so forth be looking for as they're looking around, cameras, you know, all these sorts of things um, because, you know, it, it happens. It happens everywhere. There is. It happens everywhere at any time to anyone. No one is special. You, if you think you're special, you're not. You know, you're uh, just not. I, I noticed something at my kids' schools. So I've got uh, eight and six-year-old boys, um, and um, at that school playground, as I dropped one off, um, there was a kid crying, sad, and the teacher, the lady, um, were trying to comfort them, but not. They felt they couldn't cuddle them. They weren't That's allowed ridiculous. to do that. That's one of my pet hates. Okay. That how, how do you balance so that? Well, you don't take them into a little room by yourself and give them a cuddle. You're in a playground. There's mm-hmm. people everywhere. The child is crying. Obviously, children cry naturally. They, you, it's what you want to do. I couldn't help myself. I'd have to just cuddle them. But I think there's, you've just got to be smart about it in how you cuddle them too. You know, yeah. you can, you, you know, you can. You know, imagine you know what's normal and what's sort of a bit invasive, um, in, invasive, you know. Mm. Um, but if a child's fallen over, scratched their knee and they're crying, you're going to pick them up and give them a cuddle and rub the... You just are. I mean, mm. you, you're not human if you're not going to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's but very you, human. Yeah, you're not going to take them away. The, the biggest thing is line of sight always, to be in line of sight of others. So you can never be accused of it, number one. Because that's what people fear. Yeah, you know, as though it happens every day, it doesn't. But so you can't be accused of it. But also, so that um, there's always somebody watching. It's and it should be the policy of every organisation. I know it's difficult sometimes to make that happen, and there are exceptions to that. But for the most part, never be alone with a child unless it's your own. Etty, we're probably coming towards the end of the podcast um, and in a minute also we'll talk about that question we ask all of our guests around human behaviour. But I do feel the need with this sort of the seriousness of this conversation. Is there any other pieces of advice or anything you would like to share with, with the people that listen to our podcast? Um, there's so much I want to say in so little time, but just that last comment I'm going to say, women offend too. Yep. So don't be dropping your child off with a, at a, a babysitting or whatever, thinking everything's going to be sweet and you don't have to have the same level of caution. Um, they, they do offend in much less numbers, but increasingly we're finding out that, you know, this is a serious problem. Mm. Um, so it's not about male, female, although we do, we did that before, we talked about yeah. that. Um, it's Uncle about behaviour. Yeah. Understand behaviour. If your child changes behaviour in any way, if, if your children are 
you know, outgoing, gregarious and fun, all of a sudden they're, they're in their bedroom and they're fearful or they're not sleeping or they're stop eating or they're eating too much or that you're looking for changes in behaviour. If the person hanging around them, if there's a person who's just spending way too much time with that child, has far too much interest in that child, you know, just they always want to be, I'll take them to the shops, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this, and all yeah. of a sudden gifts are showing up and there's new dolls and new toy trucks or whatever going on. Just look, just appraise, look, just educate yourself really. I can't do it all on this podcast but educate yourself. Seriously. Yeah. That's what you need to do. And for people that do want to educate themselves, where, where should they go? They should wait about three months and then there's a book coming out. I haven't Okay. <laughs> so you're, you're writing a book? I am with Dr. Sher McGilvray. We're okay. going to, we are writing a book. For, and, and that's for, going to cover? Yeah, all this stuff that everyone, just the normal stuff that people need to know. Yeah. Know? And, you know, when, when we have our babies in hospital – we, we're all told that, you know, we, the importance of breastfeeding and immunisation and brushing teeth and all of these things, right? We, no one says, oh, and by the way, one in four children are sexually assaulted and mostly it's by someone known and trusted. Yeah. Here's a little list of the things that you can, you can you should be looking for, you know? Did you have a name for your book yet? Uh, it's in progress. With, okay. We swip and swap and... <laughs> I know someone else like that. Yeah, I, so think, I think it's got to be finished and then it'll, it'll come to us. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. I spend most of these podcasts taking the mick out of Darren for not writing his, finishing his book yet and changing the names continuously. Yeah, well, this is where we are at too because we keep getting busy. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, no. Uh, and, uh, and then we get distracted and so we're, we're in it. But um, it's, it's going to be great. I mean, mm. I'm really looking for it and I think it's really necessary. I don't think parents need the academic version. They just no, they need don't. They just need the facts and they need it whack-whack. Yeah. You know, they, bang, 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 here it is. This is what you need to know. Without all the words that surround it, you know, yeah. we just I just really want people to understand what the dangers are and how to avoid them. doesn't mean you're going to because if you do, this is then what you do. Yeah. This is what you don't do and um, hopefully it has some sort of an impact. And, and we'd love to have you back if that's okay to talk about the book at some point down the track if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's such a, it's, thrilled. It's such a vast subject and such an important oh, subject. So thank you so much for coming on today. We, we seriously, seriously appreciate it. And I, and I do kind of feel, Daz, we, we've literally just sort of, Pleasure. you know, scratched the surface with this, that there's so much more to talk about. So, Yeah, but even so, though, there are some key points, tips yeah. that I hadn't even considered. And, uh, so it will make, make a remarkable difference, just, just um, people listening to some of the key points you've made. If they listen. It will make a big difference. If they, yeah. if they choose to listen. I ho- hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Well, that hopefully. leads to your last question, I think, Paul. Possibly. What human behaviour, this is a question we ask of all of our, yes. um, all of our guests, Hetty, what human behaviour do you find most annoying? Um, the failure of people to believe the truth, even when the facts are in front of them. Yeah. Um, is my, and I, you know, talking about misinformation that's that's all around the globe and even, even when those people who believe some believe A, are presented with the facts, B, they still want to believe A. Yeah. Um, we call it the Trump effect, right? Yeah, it's just awful. It is really, really awful mm. and it's doing so much damage and particularly in this area, it's just as well as any other area. Yeah, more so. The parents and people, um, even though the facts are there, are not responding. This is a crisis mm. facing our – one in four. This has got to be a crisis yeah. facing our country and it's not unique Australia. It's just everywhere around oh, the world. Oh, it's everywhere, world. yeah. And yet we don't – I mean, we, we, we react, you know, to threats of war and we buy big military machines. I'm not saying mm. we shouldn't, but we do. Um, environmental stuff, we should be reacting more, but we are. We've got a global effort and it's being pursued, thank goodness. Um, these are our children. I mean, we can have the healthiest planet in the world, but if our population isn't healthy, then we're it, something's out of rock. We've got to have it. We've got to balance this up. So, yeah, my pet hate is that people will not respond to this adequately, and so long as they don't, we're heading for the same Armageddon as we are with our environmental stuff if we don't respond. Thank you, Hedy, so much. Your passion is amazing, and and um, you know. You, you have two advocates here and there's anything else we can do to help you support you do this and, and good luck with all your work in the future because it is such incredible work so so thank congratulations you. on everything you've achieved and thank it. you and, and, and all the best with it thank you i appreciate it thank you both and if you've enjoyed our podcast today um please uh, subscribe on youtube uh, apple spotify or, or most major um sp- uh, podcast platforms uh, and we are out every tuesday morning 7 a.m australian eastern time cheers oi butch